good evening and welcome. I'm Karima Brown and you're watching Political Exchange where we unpack Africa's political economy. Perceptions about Africa often focus on the continent's many challenges. These include the battle against HIV and AIDS, intractable conflict and poverty. But are these perceptions based on real empirical data and can they be backed up with facts? To look at whether commonly held truths about Africa are in fact rooted in reality, I'm joined in our Johannesburg studios by Julian Rademeyer. He is the Southern Africa editor of Africa Check. Julian, thank you so much for joining us uh, on Political Exchange. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, we know that the world is a world that is dominated by technology and information. We have information coming at us from various sources. Um, and of course, the most important thing about information is that it must be accurate mm -hmm. and that it must be able to take you to the facts. Um, you guys have started um, a um, you know, institution that checks facts and that verifies facts. Um, let's start with just a little bit about Africa Check. Why was it important uh, for an organization such as yourself to be established, given the fact that we have so many institutions that actually develop data and that come out with data, whether it is your statistici statistics, whether it is your crime information, whether it's the UN or the Development Bank. Why do you need a fact check organization? I think part of our our role is to try and uh, ensure that there's accuracy in public debate, to encourage debate about statistics, about numbers, about reporting, um, and to look critically at that. It, it follows a sort of trend that's been set in places like the US and in Europe where you have fact-checking sites that have sprung up. Um, much of that has been in response to growing cynicism about claims by politicians, by public figures, and about whether those claims are accurate. So we're, we're a non-partisan, non-profit organization. We produce reports looking at claims that are made by public figures, public institutions, and putting those reports out there and try and challenge the numbers. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why we exist in many ways springs from the fact that, that media institutions, newspapers, traditional media houses are facing massive back, um, cutbacks in terms of the amounts of money that they have, the staffing that they have, and there's a gap for checking facts that often reporters don't have the time to check. Right. You know, they're doing so many stories a day, they don't have the time to go out there and look at the numbers that they've picked up at a press conference and they're filing a story for the next day's newspaper. So that's the, the sort of gap that we feel. We have the luxury of being able to sit back and look at those numbers mm -hmm. and look at those stories. Now, of course, um, Africa as a continent is um, constantly in the news and often for the wrong reasons and we've begun to look at the ways in which African narratives are told and of course data about Africa. We know very often people talk about um, Africa as the dark continent, uh, underdeveloped, uh, continent without history, unable to catch up with the rest of the world and so on. I've got in front of me a story that you guys checked um, that um, basically poses the question, do 80% of South Africa regularly use traditional healers and are Sangomas the first point of medical contact for 80% of black South Africans and of course this was a statistic that was being quoted by just about everybody including the World Health Organization institutions um, journalists and in fact um, you guys found that uh, this data is in fact completely false um, take us through first of all how you stumbled upon this information who requested you to verify this information and what it actually found in the end? Well, a lot of the reports that we do are crowdsourced reports. People come to us on Twitter, on Facebook primarily, send us requests and say, can you look at this? In this particular instance, it was a BBC report which quoted, um, it stated that 80% of black South Africans regularly visit traditional healers as a first point of medical contact. Yes. And it quoted authorities. It didn't state who those authorities were. It gave no further details. So we decided to try and unpack that figure. It seemed to be Quite a surprising figure, but also not that surprising because it's a figure that we've seen in other publications, and quite routinely it gets trotted out. Um, you know, in, it in was a truth. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. a truth. Um, so we sat down and we we tried to trace the roots and it involved a bit of detective work. Our researcher Kate Wilkinson dug really deeply into that um, and traced the roots of that claim. And the one, the primary source for the claim of 80 percent, and in various forms changed over the years, were World Health Organization documents, and. Essentially, in a way, it was a bit of an echo chamber. The World Health Organization was quoting and re-quoting their own reports and yes. changing the wording here and there. 
She traced it back to a book that was published by the WHO in, in uh, the mid-1980s, right. where a statement was made that 80% of people in developing countries visit traditional healers. So, so developing no, countries became yeah, Africa? And became South Africa mm -hmm. eventually. So, you know, it was, it was a question of just looking at that data. If you look, though, at some of the, the, the more current data in South Africa, the household surveys done by Stats SA, um, people that were polled in households, as little as 0.1% uh, said that they consulted regularly consulted traditional healers. So the existing data, the most current data, completely flies in the face of this claim. And, you know, 80% seems to be the number that everyone became fixated on. Right. Mm. Now, getting a number that suggests 80% of black South Africans consult traditional healers to a survey that is real and current that says um, less than 2% or just about 2% um, visit traditional healers. There's a massive gap between that two sets of mm. information. Take us through how that kind of uh, disinformation impacts on things like social planning, on things like um, you know demographic studies, and the ability of non-governmental institutions, the state, and other role players to plan effectively. Let's look at um, a question like HIV, for example. If you look at a public health issue like HIV, and you sit with data that suggests that 80% of people go to a traditional healer, if you a um, a person that works in health advocacy, that becomes an important statistic. Yes. And if that statistic is wrong, Julian, how does it impact on the work that you do and ultimately the kind of remedies that we one ought to come up with? Well, I think many of us tend to understate, you know, the, the impact that numbers have. Numbers are incredibly important. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways many people, I mean myself included, became journalists, for instance, because we weren't particularly good at maths at school. <laughs> so, you know, you've got the numbers being doled up, but you don't look at them that closely. We tend right. to routinely quote facts and figures in news stories. Um, often to support a story that we're trying to to report on yes um, and I think I think often the what what gets lost is the importance of those numbers in the decisions that policymakers make um, on how resources are allocated as mm -hmm. you've pointed out um, and there are very real-world consequences and one report that we looked at for instance are claims made by the uh, Ministry of, of Water Affairs that 94% of South Africans have access to clean and safe drinking water. Yes, and it's simply not true. It's not. If you start unpacking that, um, probably 91%, according to some of the Stats SA figures, have access to, to piped water. Now, mm. whether water actually comes out of those taps is not measured. The fact that they have infrastructure is measured. Um, is that water clean and safe? There is no barometer of that. If you look at, um, again, the, the 2011 household survey, just over 60% of people say that they believe that their water is of good quality. Mm. And that number is a number that is decreasing over the years. So those are very important things because they do impact on real world assessments of where does the department put its resources? How are those resources used? Yeah. Now, what I wanted to ask you, Julian, is why should I believe your figures and not someone else's figures? How does the ordinary person consuming information, consuming data, assess whether the information has validity, whether it is rooted in reality? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not saying you should believe our figures. In fact, I think you should challenge our figures too. And we try to encourage debate. Um, what we try and do is use the best available data that we can. We try and unpack it. We look at key things to look at when interpreting data is to look at how that data was collected, right. the sample sizes, how big were those sample sizes, to look at how that data was published, how it was interpreted, and who is interpreting it, you know, the, the context of the use of that data. Government figures, for instance, will often cherry pick data to yes. use it for their, their own advantage. Um, so you do need to treat what the claims that they make with a degree of, of circumspection and sort of look at really where that data is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what we did, for instance, in that report was to look at the available data and whether it supported um, the, the, the ministry's claims. Right. And in this case, it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, the same would go for the 80% thing. The, the, the data on you know, the number of South Africans that use traditional healers isn't very good. Mm. Um, but it's certainly, you know, the available data and the most accurate available data um, yeah. would not suggest that it's 80%. So the challenge is that you need to continue improving on data. You need to get better data out there. We've got a long way to go, I think, in South Africa in terms of getting um, access to data for people. If you look at, for instance, the census figures and how those were put out, um, they were just PDF files to journalists. Mm -hmm. 
um, what, what would actually have made more sense, which is what's been done in countries like the UK, is where the data sets are distributed. Right. And then reporters can go in and dig into that data and look for the numbers and dig quite deep down. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that. The, the PDFs are put out there. You can try and access some of the data on the StatsSA website, for instance, but it's, it's problematic. You know, the, the, the tools that are available are not the, necessarily the ideal mm -hmm. tools. I want to look at the chain of how information gets put out, um, you know, from from the source right to how it gets disseminated to the public. If, for example, we take the annual census as, a, as an example, um, let's talk about the strategy um, and the methodology for collecting that data. Many people are sus suspicious of um, state collected data. We know in the apartheid years, data was often used um, to um, support policies that were generally unsustainable if you had to apply a rational test to it. Um, things like town planning and so on if you looked at where roads were being built and you know the calculations about how many people were going to be using cars and so on there was an ideology that stood on top of a rational approach to to planning uh, we now have a democracy um, one would hope that there's a better approach a more transparent approach when one takes the census Julian do we see evidence of government being more transparent and more open or is it um, a different government but still doing the same thing trying to manipulate the numbers i think it's completely different to the apartheid years certainly and i think you know there is more data available um, the problem though is i think there's a great deal of room for improvement in how that data is is made available you know, as i pointed out the raw yeah. data or the the actual data sets let's start with with the actual head counting mm -hmm. for example i've never had a census person come and yeah. question me now i'm not sure whether that is because i'm employed and i'm not at home during the day but the person who helps me in my home has never been questioned um about by a census collector. Now, of course, this is completely anecdotal, but I'm sure there are many South Africans mm. in my position. How do we assess whether the census is in fact representative mm. or as representative as government claims? Well, I think um, that is, I mean, it's a very valid question. And there, there was quite a bit of controversy earlier in the year about the undercounts. I think it was an official undercount of 14% right. um, on, on, the, on the stats. There are systems that StatsSA has in, that are meant to deal with that and factor that in. Mm. Um, so there's a margin with which they yeah. work. But the bigger your undercount, um, the more worrying it is in terms of how accurate your count is. And those are, are challenges that are there. I think to some degree they've been addressed, but I think you know, there still needs to be quite a bit of work done. Mm -hmm. um, so those obviously are, are aspects that we do need to look at. Now let's take the information as it comes from, let's say, a government agency to, let's say, the media. Uh, we spoke about the fact that newsrooms are, in fact, juniorized, understaffed. There's not a lot of time for fact-checking. And then, of course, there's the question of deadline. People don't have the luxury of time to actually make sure that the information that they given is actually verified um, and, and double checked. Um, I worked in a newsroom, I continue to work in a newsroom and I know that we often make terrible, terrible mistakes on very big issues, whether it is uh, the impact of a strike on the economy, whether it is what a particular wage demand is, you know, figures get, um, you know, lost in that debate and in the hurry of that. What is it that uh, journalists and media institutions are doing wrong? How do we add to that chain of misinformation well I think I mean I think journalists need to question more they need to question the figures more then th that process needs to be encouraged um, we recently did a project with the Institute for security studies on the crime statistics where we arranged the seminar with them which was held to brief journalists before the before the crime stats came out we produced a number of fact sheets that looked at how crime, crime statistics are calculated um, the ISS itself did a great deal of work and some incredible work on that. And I think you could actually see that in the reporting. Um, very critical reporting, looking at the figures. The police attempted to, and the National Police Commissioner attempted to couch the statistics in a very positive way. Yes. Um, and there were a lot of questions, for instance, about how those stats were calculated, the yes. population figures that were used uh, as a base on which they were, were, were calculated, and that, quite frankly, a number of the crimes that the police said had gone down or had marginally gone up had actually gone up quite significantly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, business robberies, for instance, is one murder had also increased quite substantially. So that was challenged in many ways, and I think it is that sort of critical approach is something we try to foster, mm -hmm. and I think, I think that's the, what one needs to do. In and 
of course, journalists had the tools to ask the yeah. questions with Julian. We have to take a break. We have to take pay the bills here at CNBC. But we're done. we will continue our conversation with Julian Rademeyer from Africa Check. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching Political Exchange, where we continue our discussion with Julian Rademeyer. Julian, before the break, we were talking about the importance of journalists um, having the t uh, with which to ask relevant questions, particularly when it involves data um, within the constraints of newsrooms today, where we know people don't have a lot of time to check. Um, let's shift the focus now and go to the rest of the continent. Um, Many institutions um, on the continent find themselves under pressure. They're either underfunded or um, the information that comes out is not really that trustworthy. Um, how are how is one able to ensure that the information that comes out of countries where you have weak institutions are in fact, you know, sustainable? Um, if one takes, for example, a place like Zimbabwe, um, it has a particular image in the in the, the public perception. It's a country that's uh, collapsing. The political situation is unstable, and so on. But within that, you have a framework where people can claim just about anything, and it's very difficult to actually make sure. One of the claims that your uh, organization investigated was the fact that two million uh, people in Zimbabwe will need food aid and it was found that the claim was hugely exaggerated. Uh, now without going into the specifics of that claim, sketch how one tracks the validity of information in a country where there's already a bad public perception and where it's difficult to check the veracity of info. I think, I mean, I think it's incredibly difficult. We're in the process of expanding some of our operations to include some of the Southern African countries looking at Zimbabwe, Zambia, Swaziland, etc. Right. And the kind of data that we have, for instance, in South Africa doesn't exist there. You know, mm -hmm. the, the data that is available is often very questionable. Right. Um, so often you do have to work with the best available information that you have. And you need to look at the claims, try and challenge them, find out what, I mean, essentially the first question to ask is what is the evidence that supports mm -hmm, this claim? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and to try and test that evidence in whatever way you can, using you know, journalistic skills or using data, what, what data you can find, international data, local data, um, you know, AU data, any data for that matter. Um, so the basis is essentially to look at the claim and start off with, Okay, we have this claim that's been made. Mm. What supports that claim? But what is interesting for me is, let's say in a country where you have a fragile state, mm. where institutions are particularly weak, many people tend to rely then on your foreign agencies, your aid organizations, your NGOs, and so on. But in the case of the 80% figure about South Africans using traditional healers, that was your World Health Organization. One would assume that data coming from an organization with that kind of public profile, an international profile, wouldn't necessarily be faulty um, in states where official data is often questioned. One does re rely uh, to some extent on you know, your NGO community, your parastatals to give you the data. What happens in instances where that data itself is compromised or based on, on very flimsy foundations? No, I mean it's extremely problematic because most big international aid organizations are reliant on data they source from the countries in which right, they operate. Right. Um, so you know, UN development data is obtained from ministries in those countries and mm -hmm. that's where you find these skewed reports. Um, if you look at um, some of the claims that have been made, for instance, I mean, we, we looked at a Time magazine article recently which claimed that Africa is the drunk continent, yes. looking at drinking in Africa. That was World Health Organization data that they were citing. But they were also, they, the problem was aggregated because in, in two senses. One is that the WHO data isn't that accurate mm -hmm. um, for drinking habits across Africa and across the, the wide sort of number of countries and, and drinking patterns. The second problem there was that they, they took the data and they made a sweeping judgment call based on, on data which only really looked at a number of countries. Um, so it is extremely problematic and the best that you can do and one of the things that we're trying to do there is to try and champion better data, 
ways of improving data. You know, the, the work we've done on crime stats here mm -hmm. is, is the first step in what I see as a long ongoing process of trying to encourage better data, working on similar projects in, in countries like that. There's often uh, in the international community, there's often the tendency to look at Africa as a country yeah. and that not as a continent. Um, and of course, that is particularly problematic because you in fact have 53 countries, they're very different uh, uh, peoples, very different habits, and there's the tendency to make these generalizations and, and sweeping statements. Take us through some of the kind of um, interesting um, stories or facts that you had to debunk um, that came up, you know, uh, uh, across the continent um, and the origins of it and, and, and where it came from. Yeah, well actually just on that, I mean, um, one of our most popular reports is the number of countries in Africa. Yes. Um, we calculate, and it's actually something that's been read quite often, and that there are 55 states in Africa that are actually recognized either by the UN or the AU. Yes. If you include Somaliland, you have 56. But you get numbers reported globally, mm. which miscalculate the number of states so on that very fundamental level yeah um, again if you're looking and it is it is problematic the time the time magazine article was an ideal example of that yes treating a continent as a homogenous entity where it excluded the fact that you have for instance many Muslim states where you know very low levels of drinking yes um, the fact that the data it was based on the WHO data had it had excluded from their Africa data several countries which they'd included in the Mediterranean region so countries like Morocco like Egypt like Mauritania like Somalia Sudan had all been included under the Mediterranean region so they were excluded. simply not African they were not African and that in itself is hugely problematic so you know if you if and it's something we do see I mean I think there's some very good foreign reporting being done yes but it is that homogenous approach. What's well, the way that people try and count stories? If you look at the, for instance, the, the the Kenya situation, the Westgate massacre. Yes. And the way that the British press tried to turn this into an issue about the White Widow. Yes. Um, despite the fact that there's no evidence of that. But, but this is exactly the point. I mean, I've been watching news reports coming out of Kenya, um, and all the news reports says unsubstantiated claims that she is linked, and yet the story is the main story. Yeah. So if this, so the claims are unsubstantiated, there's no evidence that links this woman to the attack on the mall in uh, 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 Nairobi, why does it even make the news? Mm. No, that's a very good point. Um, and, I mean, the, the story there began with the Daily Mail, who were looking for a sexy headline yes and, they got and a British connection Widow and a British connection to make sense of you know a story in uh, in Nairobi and I think that in many ways with international coverage that is quite problematic because there is this disconnect I was in the US at the time of the Westgate uh, massacre and if you switched on to channel in New York a local television mm -hmm. station um, you could be forgiven for thinking that nothing had happened in Kenya you know the, the lead story was someone falling off a building if I yeah. recall yeah um, so there is that, you know, unless you pick up the, the right newspapers, I mean, the New York Times did some incredible coverage. Right. Um, but then again, you have, you know, these attempts and it's, it's trying to find that sort of local angle mm -hmm. and, and break a story down and it's hugely problematic. Mm -hmm. To what extent, uh, Julian, are people using data and organizations such as yours to push back on um, perceptions about Africa and about individual states? Mm -hmm. Are incre more nations beginning to say, you know what, let's not be mediated through others, let's speak for ourselves, let's collate our own data and put it out there. We saw a little bit during the Kenyan election uh, when a lot of international media were obsessed with the potential for violence mm -hmm. when in fact the uh, election was relative, uh, um, in fact largely violence free that Kenyans began pushing back particularly on social media mm -hmm. and challenging the kind of dominant narrative that were coming from places like CNN. Are people beginning to do that and are they using institutions such as yourself to get better information and to put a, you know, a more accurate picture of what is actually going on out. I think in my experience there, there's decidedly a thirst for fresh information, for information that does challenge those. I mean, I, I see our role to some degree as a bit of a myth-busting organization. You know, we look at these cliched claims, the 80% traditional healers, for instance, is a nice example. We've looked at other claims, um, for instance, the BBC made a, um, published or, or ran a report by John Simpson. Um, stating that there were 400,000 poor whites living in squatter camps in South Africa. It's complete and utter rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not supported by the data. We've looked at some of the, the right-wing claims looking at crime stats and trying to paint this sort of vic 
victim picture that you know there's a white genocide going on in South Africa when there isn't um, and those sorts of things so I think it is pushing back it is looking at that it is also holding public figures to account yes. um, you know we've had claims by um, the president and also by Khalema Motlanti and others about the numbers of mud schools in the Eastern Cape that are being replaced with new schools um, and claims that things would be done by certain dates. They haven't been done by certain dates. The schools that they claim were replaced haven't been replaced. Um, so it's challenging those claims. You know. And it's allowing people to use data to get more um, accountability and to have a transparent process about planning that is essentially about their lives. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at the crime stats, one of the biggest problems, and one of the biggest problems I think in South Africa is that government institutions, and that includes the police, have this impression that they own the data. They forget that that data is paid for with taxpayers' money, right. that it's actually our data. It's not your data, it's our data. And I suppose the big thing is empirical data has to be backed up by clear evidence. Julian, thank you yeah. so much. That's where we will have to leave it. Tune in again tomorrow night for another edition of Political Exchange. I'm Karima Brown. Goodbye.